Good evening, Blackpool. Yeah. Be sick of me. Anyway. <laughs> Listen, guys, this is the third uh, panel talk, and it's going to be an absolute cracker as well. We've got three utter legends. I don't mean just because they're old. Um, <laughs> to my left, I've got Mr. Dan Malone. Um, now, this isn't every game. Dan, you've worked on Colvin, Colvin too. Sig Dharma of Antiniad, and then later on for the Bitmap Brothers, you did uh, Speedball 2, Cadaver, and the Chaos Engine uh, 1 and 2. Um, at the end there, Mr. Bill Harbison from Ocean Software. Bill has done numerous games, done the artwork for Daily Thompson's Olympic Challenge Dragon Ninja, which you can see. It's actually Dragon Ninja, there you go. Uh, WAC Le Mans, Robocop, and Chase HQ. And in 16 bit, I think you did the Batman the Movie, Ferocian, and Pushover, and Jurassic Park. And lastly, but by no means, I'm sorry, you also did the Sega All Stars Racing, I think, was it, Bill? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but we'll not talk about that. <laughs> uh, no, just because it's not, it's not retro. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I did actually. Um, Put up some game footage. Now, obviously, Mr. Tim Fallon, you make nice. You make the Commodore 64 and other computers sing. We were hoping to play some of your music, but we don't have the technical thing to make it happen. Um, so, uh, yeah, Tim's you've worked on hundreds of games, including Ghosts and Ghosts. Uh, I've got to say, the synth music for that game is just phenomenal. I mean, it starts off like the rain, and it's like a how you get that to come in Commodore 64 is. It's just ridiculous. Uh, Renegade, Bubble Bobble, LED, you've worked uh, on the Commodore 64 Spectrum, Atari ST, Commodore Amiga, and the NES. So just to kick things off guys, can you just tell us all a little bit about yourselves uh, in a short background? I'll let you go first, Dan. That's all. Alright, hello everybody. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I had a software first, and worked on Cauldron, and my first game was the second album I went to, as I kind of designed for that. And then from the, and we did a game called Super Thief as well, which never got released. And then to Bitmap Brothers. And uh, yeah, Bitmap Brothers was a Chaos 2, which is not one of my favourite games. But nowadays I still do graphics, I still do illustration and animation, do a lot of comic work. I live in London and try and keep it all together. <laughs> How's that sound? That's it, for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've said it all already, haven't you? So, yeah, I've seen it in various other places, but I'm still in the industry working in VR. So I'm working at XR Games in Leeds on quite a big title. It's going to be out on Quest 2. So, uh, yeah, I'm still, still knocking about, even at my elderly age. <laughs> So we're going to hear some more of original Tim Fallen music? Um, kind of, yeah, as if not, I would say it's music heaven, so I think it's more sounds good. Fantastic, just sticking with yourself Tim, what, what, was your, uh, what was your earliest memories of video games and computers? Was it at school, was it the fog machine? Then? Yeah, it's Spectrum probably, um, yeah, first piece of, well no, it's not sure, it's the first piece of that, it's the Gates of Wars, I and yeah. Trying to, grow, trying to create sound as an X81, which you could do if you sort of think you half plug the plug the, the same, you know, you could say the program could be, so if you half plug it to an amplifier, you could kind of get a sound out of it. Um, and then the spectrum was there, like, and then you could 
Did you have much exposure like to the arcades at all? And yeah, yeah. So I was, I was, yeah, I mean, it was sort of, Yeah, my earliest memory is pop, basically. Um, and my brother writing code on a BBC, because you could type in, type in code, and make it a graphic. And I'm like, oh, that's really good. It's really sci fi. That's like, really interesting. But my love was comics. I was doing comic art continuously. My first job was an advert for a 2000 AD Star Arts. And I was reading 2000 AD at the time. Previously, it was Marvel Comics, American Marvel Comics. I grew up on American Marvel comics. And then 2008 uh, came along, which is world class. And I got the job because I did 2008 stock comics. I didn't even know it was computers. I came back to London, King's Cross, Palace Software. And they said, right, you've got the job. I'm there, what are you doing with computers? So that's how I got to the games. That's it. It's accidental. So when you guys, like, first and foremost, did you start playing games like most of us and then you started to any tink up and think this is actually more fun coding than actually playing games or how did you start writing stuff rather than just uh, playing them? I can't code at all. For me, like, I code like a magician and I was always kind of blown away by what they could make happen with the hardware. So I can't code. Uh, I just do animation, graphics, concepts and yeah, I mean, you know, looking back on it, it was a really exciting groundbreaking time. That was brilliant about it. So here we are like 34 years later. And it's great to see everybody still indoors. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. So, so, yeah, it's say, but, yeah, um, yeah, that's an interesting point though, isn't it? I, I think I wasn't particularly a game player. I was more, I was more interested in coding and playing around the sound than I was in my games. I did play with the gym, but as soon as I got to what was your first computer then? That was Felix Exxon. But, um, yeah. but I, so, I mean, I was playing games probably until 12, 13, that kind of age. But as soon as I got the job now, I kind of I, I didn't play many games. I still don't. I didn't know what I wanted to make. I didn't play them very much. Which kind of interesting. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but yeah. I've been playing games since I got copy ones at school from my computer. So I have been playing. The bar is not in law school, I've sent. The what? The bar is not in law school. No, I didn't get that far. Not that. Not that. Not that. Not that. No, it was just our, again our school. It was a hive for copy games and all sorts of real games. So I'd been playing a lot of games and didn't know what career I wanted to do. So I was going to, hopefully going to go to Glasgow Art College. But decided I would have a go at doing graphics instead and sent them around different companies. So after quite a long time of being rejected, I was finally accepted uh, at Ocean and got a job there. But yeah, it was basically, well, these games are out, so somebody must be doing graphics for them. So I just wrote off, they had the adverts in the magazines and they have the address of the, the company down at the bottom. So I just sent a little tapes off 
to as many of the addresses as I could. And luckily got a reply back. Well, I got a few replies back, but I got one good reply back. <laughs> yeah, that was all. Well, this actually leads on to my first question for you, Bill. Um, you've told me before that I believe that Ocean wasn't your first choice regards employers. Can you tell us a little bit of the backstory? Did you have to, you have to kill me afterwards? I, I tried a lot of places first. Um, basically because we were, they were going through the, the phase of Street Hawk and Night Rider, and all the games were late and were terrible. Uh, and I just thought, no, I'm not going to send it to them because I'm not going to get anywhere. So after I sent it to all the other companies that I could think of and getting rejected and getting other letters back from places like Elite, etc., um, I decided I'll just send it to Ocean and see what happens. And they said, yeah, do you want a job? <laughs> so obviously I didn't have any experience or anything. I didn't. I hadn't even had a paper in that. Point. So this was my first job, was just getting out of the little village I was from and moving to Manchester with a suitcase and getting stuck in. Yeah. Awesome. Dan, you've already kind of touched on the, you, you left Ipswich College, was that correct? And you're also looking for a career from comics. You can have a bit of a brick wall and then you later ended up one for Pal Software. Yeah. Am I right in thinking, I didn't actually write it in the matter of it's quite literally said somebody who can draw graphics or something can apply within. Yeah, it's just like comic artists. It was a, quite a revolutionary <coughs> thing. Um, no worries. Uh, they wanted um, a good comic artist because the guy that was the art director, a guy called Steve Brown, very cool guy, he, he actually gave up to do comics and uh, did his own comic afterwards. But, um, he was, he was like, look, we want to get comic artists in because it's a bit different um, and they, they, they should be able to transition across to games, pictures. Um, for me, the first thing was it's, it's so small. You actually put it like doing, like Tal in that material is 2 21 by 21s. Or was it 260 by 60s? I can't actually remember. But, you know, with brick pixels, 2 by 2 by one and I'm there, well, this is challenging. I, I actually preferred working on the spectrum because it was just normal size pixels. And you can put together a, like a high resolution compared to the blocky Commodore 64. So that was a real learning curve, yeah. But really, I mean, I, I ate it. I loved it. Uh, it was, for me, I actually learned about colour doing game graphics. When I did colour before, I did a lot of pen and other stuff. And it's more pain than all that at art college. But it's really a frack was there and all that. The greats of uh, you know fantasy art, John Buscema, Jack Kirby. So you know to go across uh, doing black and white line art, you know kind of thing. So to go across and actually get the colours, to construct the whole background, make the sprites pop out of the background, you know, like, so everyone can see what's going on. You know, it's a real learning. And to this day, I'm thinking because my, my style is pretty much based on one pixel back then. I did a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons before I got to the game. I understood how games kind of worked, um, but yeah, it wasn't. It was a, a surprise to be doing games in King's Cross in 1985 <laughs> <laughs> in the Scala Cinema, which was great. Um, and yeah, it was a learning So I, I take it you worked with the wonderful Richard Linkfield. Yes. Yeah, I've spoken to Richard a couple of times. He's, he's a bit of a dude, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's a dude. dude. He's a <laughs> super cool guy. Yeah, actually, I've spoken to him for years and just recently we've been chatting for the last year or so. So that. So did you do the graphics for the, the C64? Yeah. Colton? No, that was Steve Brown. Ah, right. What, yeah. what version did you do? I did some abstract conversion. Mm. That's what I did. And did a bit of work on Barbarian, abstract conversion work. Did a bit of work on Colton 2, just conversion work. And my first big job is C64. Also, in turn, I understand that you never actually did any formal music training. Um, and you, you left the music college after a year. <laughs> and so you left college after a year and you immediately started working at Insight Studios, uh, working in games including Agent X, Kronos and Bobble Bobble on the Spectrum. I was, <laughs> I was probably still at that school when I was doing this, to be honest, but, um, because it was, it was around the time that I was in music, yeah, music college. 
to us. Right, okay. So um, I remember you had to have your bus pass stamped to eight each term, sort of thing. So I made one term for a tutor who had not stuck my bus pass anymore because I just wasn't showing up for the lectures. Basically. So I was basically staying at home for two weeks ago. Um, and going to college in order to go to the club. <laughs> that was literally the only reason I went in. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, music college didn't last. Yeah. At so what point did you decide after leaving college that you specifically wanted a career in music to go I didn't. I mean, it's, I, I think the same a few times. You know I mean, maybe, you know, it's kind of, you, you kind of fall into it, I think, because right? you can do something new experiments. It's not like you've got some experiments in the sound. Lucky enough to have a brother that was doing some programs to get you that. Was already in a job or something. I suppose, I suppose when you think about it, I mean, the, the early days of computers, I mean, it was, it was like a fad, you know, stupid games. Who's, who's, it's never going to catch on. Yeah, you know, I told your mum and dad, you're going to go and work to write games for a computer. They'd be like, don't get it. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. That was the case. Yeah. You know, I think, like, like, I had peers when people were my age that didn't get it. Yeah, yeah but my like, peers didn't get it. Like, people that I was at our college with who went on to do design work and whatever, like, you know, what you're doing better now. This is like, this is a dead end. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm to job and I'm earning money, so I'm fine, I'm in London, it's cool. You know? <laughs> it's all right. Definitely, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. This is yeah. a job, this is just a little thing. Yeah. Not like some super turn into what the biggest industry in the world. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that all of the early 8-bit systems that you can work on again are limited regards memory, graphics, processors, etc. compared to the 16-bit machines. Um, how did you find the challenge of getting stuck to work in these systems? I mean, was, that, was it difficult because it was limited? Or did... Yeah, yeah it was, uh, very much so. I mean, when you realise how much memory you actually had to, to work, stack it up as about that much on the screen, like, right, I've got to make all this count. I've got animation to do, I've got baddies to do, I've got backgrounds to do, front end screens. You really worked with that budget. You really chopped it up to little pieces and just squeezed every last bit out. And that was a great discipline for me as an artist today. It's a unique discipline. I suppose it was quite a good grounding to actually be given a limited systems and think, right, make it work. Whereas now you get a PC and Gigs worth the data and like, process it. I don't know where to stop with it. Yeah. 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 It sounds like the same thing that you know, the limitation is the, yeah. the fuel that keeps you going. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to find it yeah. so without limitation. If you have a limitation, you're just going to flow off into the ether. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Disappear. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit too much. Yeah. yeah, it's true for programming. Well, I'll still like to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Tim, just very quickly, can I ask you, obviously, you. You, you walked in the spectrum and you called me 64. I mean, how, how challenging was it to get some of the sounds that quite certainly should not be coming out of Commodore 64? How challenging was that? It was, it was, how did you manage it? That was the fun, you know, you're trying to sort of create something that you can't technically do. And I think that's the same with graphics. Yes, you, you're trying to, like you say, cram it, you know, you've got literally 16 by 16 pixels, you're trying to make that look as good as possible. That's, it's also something that is uh, was something that no one was doing. Uh, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't any kind of precedent for it. You know, so you kind of well, you were on, yeah, you were on your own doing that. Um, and that was probably something to spur it. That's why it's so hard to date. It was like yeah. you're just the first person to do this kind of thing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah that was the thing. You just had no nothing to base it on. Yeah. Apart from, I was looking at, always looking at the arcades, the arcade games. <coughs> yeah, I want to do it like that. You have to do like that. But we've got this sort of memory in like four colours, Commodore 64, and so on and so forth. I was always impressed with the colour of the spectrum. It was terrible, wasn't it? It was terrible, which is why the numbers are black and white. So there's no colour in any of these games. If, there's about, if you look at something like Chase HQ, they're like, oh, it's yellow. <laughs> which is which is my main criticism. It's it's, it's, it's yellow. Yeah. Look, look, there you go. That's it. That's a C sixty four version. You've got higher less sprites, which you can port across to the spectrum. Yeah. Um, no, 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 no. It's, it's a few, the, the, the pumpkin is high res. I say high res. It's not really high res at all. It's better <laughs> <it's laughs> like you know Commodore two by four bricks, two by one bricks is high res. 
сейчас когда дальше смотреть, да и так, все банки, да. Там, кто уже дал, там. So, well, you've still answered your question. Uh, so, how did you, uh, you did, how did you find the restrictions of like walking in the street on the road? Was that was that a barrier or was that something that you know, really challenged? Like, that, 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 <laughs> that was it. So there, there was no restrictions. I just uh, did the graphics, and the animation, and whatever they didn't want to use, they just took out. So I was like, fine. Like uh, GCHQ, I originally did six phases of the cars going into the distance. We only used four. So, you know, they, they just cherry picked what they needed. I just did the stuff and then they would take what they needed and put it in. Because, you know, yeah, the programs knew what they were doing. They, they knew they had a certain amount of like, memory for graphics. So, you know, so we didn't go around. Can I ask you all, how difficult was it transitioning? Because you've all worked in 8-bit machines and then you obviously transitioned to 16-bit. How, how did you find that, going from like limited hardware to custom chips, and yeah. four channels of sound and that kind of thing? How did you find that? Oh yeah, that was great. That was really exciting. 16-bit well, came along, that was really exciting as well. Bigger palettes, higher resolution, and get closer to the arcade now. Get closer to that. And really make things smooth. I was, that was very exciting, remember that clearly. We, we did um, an Amstrad version of Super Thief, Super Thief. Uh, which never got released. Uh, we, we initially worked on the Commodore version and I was doing layered sprites. So I was doing high res sprites layered, so three, so I could get a high res shading. Then of course, um, we, we, Palace decided to uh, develop the Amstrad version first. Because the Amiga was still a bit quiet, Amstrad was a certain machine. And I did the whole game. That's my first 16-bit experience. Oh, I, was, I was really excited because I'm going to get closer to real lush graphics now. Yeah. That's one of yours, isn't that? Yeah, that's could happen, yeah. It's Actually, it started by another guy and that came in because the thing was falling apart. I, just, I did these uh, displays here, the status, and Eric actually lost two weeks worth of work. He rang <laughs> up about one o'clock in the morning and said, Dad, I've lost these graphics. <laughs> so I come back to do one more again, but basically this is working with somebody else's. Like the, the guy is another guy, I can't remember the guy that I went here, but that's not my work. The dwarf, it's just the background. And the uh, status of it. And this goes, yeah, of course. Somebody brought that ocean. game into ocean. I remember somebody bringing that game into ocean and saying, really? wait till you see the graphics <laughs> and the mess. <laughs> and the ST and the Eagle. And could we just like look at it up? <laughs> One again for you, Bill. Uh, going by everything that I've kind of heard uh, and read and the internet, etc., it seems that Ocean was quite a kind of cool place to work. Did you see that was quite a true reflection? Was it, was it work hard, play hard, pool parties, woman, <laughs> trucks? I can't really comment on that. It's a message that she's not here. Um, yeah. Well, we didn't think it was at the time. It, it wasn't any different than anywhere else. It was just a bit like, like uni. Only there was no teachers. And Gary was in occasionally, so... We always knew when Gary wasn't coming in. So, like, right, my right, work's getting done today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But, but I have heard instances of um, parties in Gary's office, people shotgunning cans of Budweiser and then reaching the ceiling. Um, somebody, you know, you're, like, you're supposed to put a knife into the can and stick it through. Oh, no. no. Well, apparently put the knife straight through his hand. <laughs> had to go to hospital. So it, it wasn't, I, I don't think anybody was using anything illegal, as far as I know. It was pretty tame, really. The supper creation talked about that. <laughs> yeah, they were all in the gear there. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was fixed.
Oh, no, sir. <laughs> I've mentioned already, I've been lucky to talk to Richard Leinfeld a couple of times, he's a really, really top cool, cool, cool. Yeah, he's, he's, he's got a working sense of humour. He's the first guy I ever met in the game. Yeah. First guy that greeted me at the door. Yeah. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? And he actually told me an interesting anecdote about Cauldron. If anybody's played Cauldron on the, the 8 bits, especially C64, it is the most impossible game ever. It literally is a lot of bad games, but it's literally, you know, dead. And he told me what he actually did was, um, they, they recorded the game onto like a specific length of tape and after the game had finished loading it would then run for like 10 seconds and then it would come at the end of the tape and there was something built in there if you put it on a C90 and it would keep running it would automatically make it twice as hard. <laughs> Clever. That's Clever. So, I, don't, I don't think you can actually finish it. It's a part where you can't make a jump. Deep in the castle. So how how can he what was it quite a cool company to work for? Palace yeah, was quite, yeah. quite a small team, I believe. Yeah, it was small, um, they were part of Palace Pictures, so you're right, it was like film events and there was people coming in and out. Like Pat Mills came in once ago at the start of 2018. He came in, we were discussing a project. They were really exciting, open to any possibility to work for. Unfortunately, yeah, the transition to 16 bit and Palace Films were, went bust and then we pulled the cover side and down. It's a real shame because they were a very cool company. Mm -hmm. In uh, Scala Cinema, which is a mad place to work, it's a mad place. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tim, did you have any sort of gay musicians who influenced you and perhaps paved your way into the industry? Were you away near the Rob Hubbard and Mark Galway and all these guys, David, what, David Whitaker? It was, well, well, well my name was Rob. But I mean, yeah, I certainly listen to what people are doing, you know, what, what the standard was, you know, what the, where the bar was, sort of thing. Um, but you know, you can't, you can't stay out, you can't, you can't listen too much, you know, because you can start thinking, you know, you've got to figure out things, yeah, so, yeah. You just have to kind of take notice of it, you know, because you just say, yeah. So all all you guys are for the leader. All you guys are to produce uh, work for the leader systems. What would you say was your favourite of the week? I could all know that feeling. Systems. What would you say was your favourite unit? 8-bit, 16-bit PC? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think 16-bit was the best. Yeah, I think it was the best. Yeah, I think it was the best. 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 Sorry. Yeah, yeah, 16-bit was the best. And my favourite song. But I went really going to Sony and got the PlayStation 1 and stuff. And TV and that. For that, for that two games, unfortunately, so many and so many were more interested in licenses rather than the original product. So that end last day, I left that to my hands. But that was not exciting process. I mean, yeah, I think maybe Sorry, um, <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, I get to use the best theory, the most 
to work against and then you work the most challenging sort of thing. I can see the advantages of the book, I think. Um, I mean, when you read Echo Latin, I was the real best of the school, so you know, it's music. Um, so you know, yeah, music. Yeah. And that was the point where I kind of lost interest in all this stuff. I think listening back was, I found um, an old mini disc uh, player, which I used to match to stuff on to it, and it was very legit for me. So. Um, but, um, so, yeah. uh, but, you know, listening back to that stuff, I think I kind of, you can hear the sort of enthusiasm for it dying over about, you know, from about 94 to, you know, when it was 10 years later. You know. I think that's the thing. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> as, again, as a, as a game consumer, when we all heard like Sting and Spring and Monty when they're on, we're like, wow. And now you load up the latest game in the Xbox and you don't say, oh, that, the music's amazing. No, it's, it's, it's just real music. It's yeah. like whatever. You just kind of take it completely for granted. That's what the track on it, you know, it is really broken. Yeah. I've heard people who's working on it, so I think. Work with orchestras and then go to, you know, Richard James, for instance, and all that. And, you know, it's great what they did, they're achieving. It's just, you know, Lost interest at that point. Yeah. I think I was more motivated by the motor, by the limitation than I was by the yeah. you know, music. So. And the same question yourself, Bill, what was your favourite year, would you say? Well, all of this is fine, but I didn't really start enjoying myself until I get into 3D. So, uh, yeah, I'll, putting pixels down on the screen didn't do it for me, so I wanted to do something a bit more, a bit more than that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you so, what, I, 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 16 bit, um, Liga, I, I just wish we could have carried on. Because you could have developed, I mean, still stuck in right now, it's great. I was fighting to go forward. And I don't think Bitmax could tra transition. I mean, they did Z, which was 3D, 3D touch sequence. And I loved it, like you, I thought it was very exciting. But, I'd love to, if the Amiga could have had bigger Amigas and more uh, memory capacity for graphics, so then I would have got to just carry on doing it. Is a, um, I, I like comic art, that's my love, but pixel art is a certain thing. It's a kind of relaxing kind of click, 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 and you just, it's not relaxing when you try to make a deadline but, <laughs> um, at all, but um, there's a certain view. In it. How aware were you guys regards like magazine reviews because obviously this is pre-internet when a game came out to get reviewed. Um, were you aware of the reviews? Did you go to W. Smith look around and go, and did you take it to heart if, if the game was banned? Um, uh, most of my games did alright review wise, so I was kind of like, oh that's a nice review. Oh, 8%, 9%, I'm happy with that. Um, if somebody did criticise it, you'd like, well, we tried doing it. So there was never really much of a problem with that at all. It was just like, get up, just get on with the job here. But getting a good review was always a good feeling. Yeah, very good feeling. I don't remember getting like, reviews, but like you said, I think it was a sense of, um, you know, the fact that anyone was doing this at all. You know what I mean? There was a certain sort of like, appreciation for that, wasn't it? Yeah, it's lovely. I remember when I was buying Crash magazine or whatever it was, I was buying Crash and Zarks. 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 The magazines would suddenly get a nice big crate of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, wouldn't, you don't really take reviews that seriously when you know stuff like that. And then, obviously, they've got the power to say, well, you don't give our game a good review, we just won't put any advertising in your magazine for the next, well, indefinitely. So, we didn't have that many bad reviews anyway. But uh, yeah, it's a really good review. Like, uh, don't mention that. Don't mention that. <laughs> I think with some operations would have paid for reviews. I think Richard would have spent a million on that. 
<laughs> I mean, we've all seen some utterly, utterly shit games that had absolutely stonking graphics, incredible music. Um, I'm looking at you, Shadow of the Beast, from the Needle. Did it annoy you at all when you were asked to produce content for a game which was later planned and sold very little, or did you just look upon it as it's your job? Um, or, did you, or did you look at it and think, well, the game might be shit, but the, the music was top notch? How did you take that? Uh, well, I was, I'll get to the stage where I was having a lot to do with the design of the game and conceptualise it. Chaos Engine, we were working on that before it actually got the green light to go ahead with it. We were designing characters and talking about the world and talking about how we do it. Later on, as a freelance artist, yeah, um, there is a frustration when you get involved in doing a lot of graphics for a game and you're working all night and you're putting up a lot of yourself into it, that, where's the game designer, what's he doing, this is terrible. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. I mean, uh, would be, I'd have to go in and say, look what you're doing. Um, but as a freelancer, you want to work, so just give you a work. So you have to kind of come to that. It's actually about briefing. If you get a good brief and you just do the work, it's fine. I, I'm not going to worry about it. But if it's a bad brief and you have to do design work to make the work work, and they mess it up, then yeah, no, it's a problem. <laughs> Big time. Yeah. yeah, I think like my attitude really changed when, you know, when I was working at some places. I really just did the music. I didn't really care that much. But what the game was like, and who we play most of them, to be honest, you know, because I was quite sort of detached from the show. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, now I kind of look back, especially because I look back into making indie games now. Um, I look back at the, my attitude back then, and I think, you know, if I had employed someone like me, I would have sat them straight away. Because I mean, they were just doing, you know, I was just doing my own thing. Okay, which, but definitely, I think, like, now, yeah, it's, I just wouldn't want, you know, I did do quite a lot of games, music games, that just, uh, didn't do that well, you know, uh, and I kind of, fortunately, didn't really care that much, because I sort of left the industry by the time it came back on the internet, and people were reviewing those games, you know, but at the time, I didn't really care to do good old man. <laughs> um, yeah, I've worked on quite a few stinkers, and you know at the time that they're going to be bad, so you just go for the effort, just make them look, just do enough so that you don't get fired, and then just hand them in, because nobody's going to say, redo that. So, there's a few, uh, Rubber Cop 3 in the snacks, anybody got that? No? No? <laughs> um, but it, that was like 55 quid when it came out. And we didn't care. You know, While we were doing it, you know, we, didn't, we didn't care about what was happening. Because it, the movie was late. Uh, programmers were okay, but not really up to the job of like AAA, Nintendo. Game. So it was like, why are we doing this? Just, just get it out and move on to the next project. One for you, Tim, is there a specific tune that you've composed which you're most proud of? Um, in game music for Girls and Ghosts, as I've already mentioned, is just mind blowing. I really wish I could let people hear it today. Um, so, what, what's your most, what's, what's the piece of music on any platform that you're most proud of? And is there a piece of music or a sit tune that, that was done by somebody else that you think that was that was pretty damn good? I don't I find it really difficult to it's, it's this concept of being proud of something, I just don't really get it to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know what I mean? It's kind of I'm I kind of I'm happy with things that I did at the time, but to me it's kind of once it's done, it's gone. I'm not really that precious about stuff that I did in the past, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know what it is. Did it move on? Yeah, basically, yeah. I'm, I kind of, so I mean, there's lots of pieces that I know I enjoyed making at the time. I know kind of think, yeah, I was kind of happy with that at the time. I'm not sure I would listen to it now, you know what I mean? Um, but, um, yeah, uh, it's a difficult question to answer, yeah. Dan, you obviously went 
to what we bit map others later on. Again, I think it's fair to say that the graphics of all these games were utterly sublime. You know, they really were. It was, this was the level before, and then it went up here. What process did you follow when it came to designing graphics? Um, were you given a background to the game, and was it left to you to kind of come up with specific things to go? What sort of like? Yeah, um, Speedball 2, which was my first game for Bitmaps. Uh, Speedball 1 had already come out, obviously. And we were playing that in Palace Software, and I was like, wow, this is beautiful. It's, I've got to work with Bitmap Brothers. And Palace came apart at the scenes, and the first people I tried to get work from was the Bitmaps. And I was fortunate enough to get straight in there. And they said, right, we're doing Speedball, we're doing a sequel to Speedball. Are you interested? I'm like, I don't know. I'm so interested. And so I had that to, to work from, I had Speedball 1 to work from, an idea. But I had a free reign to come up with other ideas and I didn't have to follow the graphical look that Mark Coleman had, the look of the characters, the armour and that. So I had a little bit of lead, uh, elbow room to uh, be creative. Um, and it, everything's on paper first, all pencil. So I did loads of stuff on paper that never made it into the game. Um, and then straight into Deep Paint and the mighty Deep Paint. I, I love Deep Paint, it's a great piece of software. Um, and yeah, from there, once you're animating, you're leaving the, 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 the pencil work behind and just going straight into the pixels. Uh, yeah, and then you think. Bill, we obviously work at Ocean. Did you ever get to work with the, the late, great Mr. Jofa Smith, who, if anyone doesn't know, was probably one of the best Spectrum programmers that ever lived. I mean, he could do graphics, he could do sound, he could program, he was <coughs> just phenomenal. Did you ever get to work with him? No. <laughs> Tim! <laughs> well, he was in Liverpool. <laughs> he was, he was uh, working in Liverpool and we were in Manchester, so I think we visited the Liverpool office about once. And we were like, oh, where is he? Is he around? No. He's not, he's not in today, so I never actually got to meet him. Never ever did. Um, when you guys saw a game in the shelves which you had helped design, <coughs> did, you, did you want to see it immediately? I did that. Uh, did it make you proud? We would move them around on the, on the display so that they were at the front. <laughs> if any, any of our games came out and there was some other game in front, they would just like move it to the front so that more people would see it. <laughs> Was there any piece of work that you guys did that you, you look back and go, actually, that was a bit of shit? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I always mark my work out of 10 when I send it, I'll finish it. So it was, it was below a 7, I generally don't send it. I'll, I'll go all night and fix it. I put everything into everything I do, so um, my family and friends say, well, you know, Stop it, just do them enough, but I'm kind of like that. So, there's a few things out there that I think are crap. But like earlier, if it's a bad game design and that the other side is messed up, I, I don't like it. it. Makes me unhappy. <laughs> Same one yourself, Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, it's kind of like, I didn't really have a sort of way of you know, thinking oh, I'll put less into this than something else, I think, so, um, you know, I just kind of did the same process each time, you know, so, I can look back, so, you know, I don't know, that's any kind of judgment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That will go up for me. <laughs> Shut up about it. There was a worse one than that. I told you about this on the video, there was a PC girl called uh, Flesh Beast, which was a horror game. Because I was just doing like the video sequences between the levels, so I hadn't actually seen the game running until I was asked at the end to do some, well, we found the guy here that what, did Quake, haven't we? So we're doing basically Quake skins with characters. And then saw the game and it was awful. We don't even, I don't even know how it got released, but look on YouTube. <laughs> so bad. 
Did you guys go to any of the kind of vintage computer shows back in the day? I know like motion and stuff, big like stands and that kind of stuff. Did you, did you ever go along? Uh, yeah, but went to all, most of the most of the shows and the conferences. Uh, if we had a game release, I'd be on the stand talking about the game. Um, and the last one, the last big one I went to was in Las Vegas, and I have little memory of it because it was non-stop. Um, but yeah, we were always meeting other peers, other people doing the same thing at the shows, and that was always cool. Yeah. I've only been to one in London. I think I got a chance to go to two, but I wasn't able to go to the second one. And then when everybody came back, they were like, Gillian Anderson was there. <laughs> so, yeah, missed it on that one, I'm afraid, yeah. No. No, I haven't got to win. No rewards. I've touched on obviously video magazines, reviews, etc. Did you guys ever get invited up to like Ludlow to Zap Towers and mm -hmm. all these places? No, never really go. Walk back in the day? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I knew Gary Penn and all the Zap lot, yeah. 64 lot. And um, yeah, we had a couple of <laughs> sessions together. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there were small teams, Palace was a small team, but my brothers was a small team, so... I mean, I was the only artist on each game, so... You want to meet the artist, and then go, you're going to meet the other people, you're going to talk to them and... try and influence them. Nice review, please, kind of thing. <laughs> Just uh, one left, uh, does the fact that there's people here today who want to listen to you guys wax and lyrical and... People still want to enjoy your games. Is that, does that surprise you at all? That people still want to play games that you made 30 years ago? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Because you see the PlayStation 5 and the new Unreal Engine, and then bloody hell, games are going next level. Um, and the fact that people still do celebrate the old stuff is, is lovely, to be honest. Yeah, it's, so it kind of makes it all worthwhile. Because there was a lot of pain involved in making those games. <laughs> No, it is just, yeah, it's always been, since I've been on the internet, appearing and getting emails about music that I've long since forgotten about. And then, then it was going, oh, right, there is still something affectionate about like here. I think it's more, you know, a rationalisation of it is that it's, a, it's an affection for uh, an emerging technology. You want to know something that happened at that point in time, it's never going to happen again. Right? So, in that sense, there's a certain, you know, there's something about it that's never. You know, so he's not coming back, so it's, it's a question. It's a privilege to be part of that. Yeah, yeah. What's the question? <laughs> 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 oh, the people play for your own game. If I still talk about this 40 years on, does that surprise you? Never thought it would happen. Because once we'd finished doing the game, we're on to the next one. So we didn't have any concept that there was like little kids playing these games at home because we were already on to the next project and the next one and the next one. Uh, the only thing that happened to me was I got a fan letter from somebody who wrote, <laughs> wrote into Ocean and said that they, they had bought Chase HQ and they really enjoyed it and like well done to the team. That was it. That, that was the only experience of, oh yeah, people are actually playing this, and I don't know if they do actually play them now, do they? Really? Yeah. 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 If they do, it's great. Yeah. And just before I open the, the questions up to the audience, I've got one, um, one for you, uh, Bill. After working on the Spectrum and uh, abstract versions of uh, Chase HQ to critical acclaim, what do you think of the C64 version? <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't say in front of all these nice people. <laughs> Go on. We didn't even know it was being done. We, we didn't even know who was doing it because obviously me and John Bryan did those two versions. We didn't even know there was a Commodore 64 version being done. And it was only a few years ago that I knew about it. Been released, 
and it was awful. <laughs> Understatement. <laughs> right, listen guys, I'm going to open up. Stick your hand up if you've got, um, you want to ask a question to any of these gentlemen at all. Thank you, Colin. Um, question for Dan. Uh, you mentioned you were quite involved in the early days of um, Chaos Engine. I just wondered the early designs how it changed to the uh, end product. Um, yeah, we were working. Phil Wilcox, I mentioned it was, it was his concept, Chaos Engine. Um, and we, I was working on Speedball 2 still, he was sitting beside me and he was doing ideas for uh, Chaos Engine. He said, and I was just starting to draw characters and um, the thing was very much fluid between us, we were like, he was, we were just starting to work on it and basically I had to really hustle to get people to done. I think I was doing the um, Atari ST port because we did everything on the Amiga first because um, I wanted to, I didn't want to use the same graphics, I wanted to, to use the Amiga palette properly for the Amiga version and then do a separate version for the anterior. Um, Atari, um, and there was a lot of trouble about that because we were going late on development. Um, so yeah, working on Chaos Engine was cool because it was like a, a new project and I'd been on Speedball 2 about a year non-stop. We, we did a lot of work on that, a lot of stuff that didn't get into the game. And so it was a real pleasure to work on Chaos Engine and I'd have to say it's come out pretty good. I was quite pleased with the end result. A question for Bill. No. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, you to bet about uh, Chase HQ on the Spectrum, uh, which you had to do in yellow. Uh, how did you feel about doing it in the lovely colours of the Amstrad? And which of the two versions is your favourite? The Amstrad version probably took a month after we'd done about five months of the Spectrum version. Uh, it was good having all the colours, I'll say that, but is it as fast as the Spectrum? No. <laughs> That's a pretty start. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was good with, the, with all the extra colours and stuff, I didn't like the way everything was like twice as, as wide, so I couldn't get everything as like defined as I wanted to, but you know, it came out alright. Message to Tim. Uh, I just want to say uh, thanks for signing my copy of Solstice the last time you were here. Oh, right. <laughs> but uh, I also just wanted to ask, you're also saying that you're doing your own indie games. Yeah. Is there any thoughts about bringing your sound, sound vision, I guess, to other indie games? Yeah. Um, I've not been asked to do it, to be honest. Um, if you, I mean, someone asked me, um, and I'm saying that, but it's true, I think I have been asked to do it. Um, I don't what I said. Probably. <laughs> 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 I said I was too busy, which I probably was at the time. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, it's a sort of full-time thing, what we're doing, but, you know, so it's, it's just kind of having the time, the enthusiasm to do something. I, I think it's, it's someone else's project, you know, so I'm kind of, you know, kind of got it now, I think, my perspective now. I think in the, in the day I would have just said, yeah, I'll just do something, you know, so I to do that. But now I think I have to, you know, I'll have more input in making it fit and all the rest of it. And it's more of a commitment than sort of doing my own work. So, potentially, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, for everyone, really, have you, are you surprised, really, that um, even now, after all these years, there's people like myself and other coders that are still making games for these old systems? In a way, no. I, I mean, yeah, it's a surprising thing, isn't it? I would, you, <laughs> 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 They were all like perfect systems. They all, yeah. they all seemed to work, and they had the limitations, and everybody yeah. stuck to them. So yeah, that's, the, that's the problem. Isn't it? You're gonna have to. <laughs> yeah. So no, it's it's not surprising, but no, it's good that they still keep it going. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I I think it's it's a little bit like vinyl, perhaps. You know, this love of a kind of certain thing, and there's a much more efficient. A way of playing or listening to music, uh, for instance. 
Uh, um, yeah, I think it's great. I think it's really human. It's a human thing to like celebrate these kind of much loved machines um, and to, you know, current developers making uh, games for those machines. I think it's really cool. Yeah, really cool indeed. Yeah, we picked this. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, people still write music for a guitar, don't you? They still pick up yeah, guitar yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's, just, yeah. to me, that's an analogy to that. It's kind of a, it's a tight limitation, but that is kind of why you do that, you know, because of the limitations. So, yeah. 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 That's just... <laughs> Question for Dan, uh, what was your favourite project that you actually worked on, on any format, any machine? I'd have to say Speedball 2, um, because I had a real free reign on it. Um, I was kind of left alone to just work out ideas for the first month at the bitmaps. And um, a lot of stuff got in. It was a pretty rambunctious time. Um, in the games industry uh, with the birth of 16-bit or the coming of 16-bit and if I look back those two games, Chaos and Speedball 2 they're actually the favourite, favourite I've worked on a lot of games in, in my life since 16-bit and those two are my favourites apart from a few failed personal projects which never saw the light of day unfortunately but yes, yeah, Speedball 2 Questions, guys. I'll ask a question for Tim. How did you find working with the SID? <laughs> Programming it, coding it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that was always. I think I look back on that. I think, yeah, it's talking about limitation. It was probably, yeah, probably the favourite. Well, that, and, I mean, obviously, I only did one thing on the project on the um, Sega Genesis. I think we call it Genesis. But. Um, uh, I really enjoyed that sort of thing. Um, I'd say I didn't really get much chance to do much of that. So it just had that analog feel, didn't it? You know, so it was kind of that was, yeah, it felt like you were kind of playing on it rather than throwing it, you know, so that I really enjoyed that. Apart from the filter issue that it had, it was different than every machine, you know, so. Yeah, so I remember trying to do a distorted guitar sound, which you could do with the right filters. If they were right in this right, Point, but every machine was different, so you know, the programmer actually had to use the plus and minus to alter them down to get yeah, as, as if anyone would sit there doing that. <laughs> very, very last one for Bill. Come the 64 or Spectrum. Spectrum. <laughs> every day. So you were cutting out there, Bill, so the end of Tim? Spectrum. <laughs> In terms of writing music, Spectrum 64. Yes. And, but having said that, I enjoyed my, you know, having <laughs> doing that. And when you die, Corpus X Spectrum really does stick in the memory. Um, I'd like the colours on the Commodore 64, but yeah, it's close. Probably the Spectrum. Probably. <laughs> Guys, give it up for yeah. Bill. Thank you very much, Lance.